Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let me begin by uh, welcoming you to Singapore on behalf of all the people here. <laughs> it is a real pleasure, it's a real honor um, to speak to you. Of course, many of us have already seen many of, uh, of your videos uh, online and today, of course, uh, the one just before this. Now, as you know, the topic uh, for today is the impact of Indian civilization uh, on the world. It's your topic, but you keep putting uh, me in the yeah, dock. I'm going to put you on the spot for <laughs> <laughs> And um, before we go beyond that, I, I'm going to put you on the sp uh, uh, try and get you to try and define what we mean by Indian civilization in the sense that, um, and particularly what, I, what I'm what not trying to get into is, of course, you know, this impact of Indian civilization on mathematics in ancient times of software today but really the impact of Indian philosophy, our way of life, on, uh, on the world. And I'm, I'm going to start with asking you, how is the backbone of this civilization, whether you call it Hinduism or the Dharmic tradition, how is that uh, fundamentally different from other ways of thinking about civilization? <laughs> You use the word backbone. That is the essence of uh, Indian civilization. It doesn't have a backbone because what a backbone means is the form is determined. Your body takes on this form because the skeletal system is a fixed thing. You can change a little bit, you can make it big or small, but the skeletal system is a fixed thing, nobody has changed the shape of their bones out here. They only can put on some flesh or reduce some flesh. So backbone essentially means that you become a vertebrate. Vertebrate means you can only change your form marginally, not completely ever. But the ethos of Indian civilization is, it's like an amoeba. It can change, it can integrate, it can drop with impunity. So, the essence of Indian culture is it doesn't have… it is not a vertebrate, it's an invertebrate. Okay, if you are an invertebrate, but there must be something that gives it a certain cohesiveness surely. Otherwise, to say that it is an amoeba, uh, you know, there is a danger here that we, we fall back on saying, you know, Hinduism is a way of life. <laughs> no. Ultimately, it means nothing. So I'm going to have to press you on and try and get you to give me some things which I would say is a more… Uh, this question is coming because both you and me and almost everybody here, whatever type of education they have received, fundamentally is Western. Largely that's the only education system left except for a sm few small pockets. So when I say Western, I'm not talking about a particular nation or a particular continent. We are looking at that aspect of life or that part of humanity which wants their life in straight lines. When we say Eastern, we are talking about that aspect of humanity which does not want to be put in between two lines. Mm -hmm. So, because the very way of thinking has become purely logical, irrespective of whether it makes life sense or not, being logically correct has become more important than having sense about life, how to conduct life. Everything is logically correct but nothing works. People are just breaking their minds trying to live their life, but it's correct. And today, <laughs> You know, the food industry on the planet is 7.6 trillion. The pharmaceuticals are 7.2 trillion. They tell me by 2017, pharmaceuticals is going to become larger than food industry on the planet. This clearly shows that our sense of trying to handle life in straight lines has not worked. Though we have great inventions, though we have all kinds of preventives for every kind of uh, 
you know, epidemics and pandemics we used to have in the past, still more people are sick than ever before. So this is what I mean by saying, we are correct on everything, but it doesn't have any life sense. What we call as India is a profound sense of life, but we are never correct about anything. I think basically what, what you're describing is really a evolving ecosystem, it's a messy it's, system. It's, it's like, it's not messy, that is what a Western man would think. Okay. Uh, it's like uh, the difference is between that of a manicured garden and a forest. A manicured garden looks nice, but nothing except human beings walk on it. So ultimately at some level it's dead? Uh, it is alive but latent. If you don't tend to it for three months, it's all gone. A forest is not like that, no tending is needed. If you come back after a million years, it still thrives. But one who thinks in a linear fashion, a forest seems to be messy, forest seems to be chaotic. Uh, it's not chaotic, there is a very profound order, but that order is not in straight lines because it's an invertebrate order, now that you brought the spine into this picture <laughs> So I think that's a fabulous way of thinking about it because basically what you're describing is a continuously churning but there is an order in that churn, in the sense it's, a, it's an act of seeking, of innovating, um, it's a civilization really, it's a risk-taking civilization, would you say, a, a civilization that thinks of adventure? Now you're being uh, an economist <laughs> <laughs> If you use the word adventure, <clears throat> usually it means that you're taking a risk with your life, you're doing something risky, which uh, is a danger to your life, but you manage to come out of it, it's an adventure. If you don't manage to come out of it, it was a stupid action, all right? That's how it is. If you successfully come out of a dangerous situation, it's called an adventure. If you don't come out, you are just stupid, <laughs> isn't it? So if you do a stupid act successfully, you're adventurous. <laughs> or you're a risk taker. Uh, you're talking in economic terms? It could be an intellectual risk or it could be… Intellectual… Uh, see, science is also intellectual no, no. Intellectually there is no risk, that is the beauty of the intellect. You can do whatever you want, there is no danger. <laughs> in your mind, you can do whatever you want, there is no danger. That is what… that is where the Indian ethos comes from. Human intellect was expanded in such a way, they looked at everything in every possible way because there was no danger. They did not believe in putting their physical body into danger because this is not something that you can create. If you destroy this, it's over. But in our minds, every concept we have, every philosophy we have, every idea we have, every ideology we have, we can crush it right now, this moment. Next moment you can come up with a whole new world. So our sense of adventure was purely intellectual, but the Western sense of adventure was all physical. Physical adventure can be… cameras can capture it, you can make a movie out of it. Intellectual adventures cannot be captured like that. Even if it is expressed in some form, in the form of literature, philosophy or whatever, very few people will get it, all others will ignore it. Everybody can… you know, large part of the world, I, I was surprised to know that uh, whatever this one… you know, one mad wrestling matches are going on on the television, some crazy… yes, whatever, some crazy stuff, it's not even real. And it's most unesthetic, but I heard this is the most popular channel in India right now. It is, yes. Even my son is watching. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most anesthetic thing, but it's popular because physical things are something that everybody can identify with or instead of saying everybody, even the grossest mind will understand physical things. 
But intellectual adventures, it will take a some level of appreciation, some level of refinement within you to understand the intellectual adventure. When I say intellectual adventure, let's look at it like this. It's not now. Even five thousand years ago, if you go back to the times of Mahabharata, what they are speaking, even today in modern times, most people cannot come to terms with it, it's that revolutionary. But these adventures were done, people ignored everything. If you say, for example, five thousand years ago, Harappa Mahanjadaro, what did you read in your book, your textbook? They had a very organized drainage system. But to build a city like that, how people should have been? What should their thought be? How should they be thinking? What were they doing? What was their trade? No, nothing about that, nobody read anything about that. Everybody reads very good drainage system Harappa Mahanjadaro had. All of you must have read this, isn't it? <laughs> and is it… is an entire civilization about drainage system, I'm asking? No, I think you bring up a very interesting point about civilization is more than, of course, the drainage system, but it's about a certain spirit. I, I'm sure in the minds of the people who lived in those cities, drainage was the last thing on their mind <laughs> <laughs> No, I agree with you. And in fact, um, one of the interesting things about Indian civilization is that this, this, uh, this uh, intellectual adventurism or culture that you just described uh, was enormously attractive because it spread across uh, the world, taken by Indian merchants. Um, of course, we now live in this part of the world, um, you know, we, live, we are in a, in a city called Singapore, the lion city. The very name is… Uh, and in <laughs> fact, um, you know, the largest uh, Hindu temple in the world is not in India, but in Cambodia, in Korwat. And all the way across through to um, uh, Korea, where in fact, uh, many people might not realize, but Koreans say that their civilization starts with a Korean prince marrying a princess from Ayodhya. So, this is certainly a, a very attractive… Don't tell me North Korea came from North India and South Korea came from South India. <laughs> that, well, this, evidently, evidently they, they think their civilization started from central UP. So, <laughs> Nevertheless, the point I'm trying to come to is that this way of thinking that we had at a certain point in our, in our, in our history, uh, we seem to have in some ways lost it at, uh, uh, along the way. But do you think in, in, in many ways this, this sense of intellectual and cultural adventure is, is coming back? You cannot say it's coming back, it can be brought back. Is it coming back? I don't think so not in a large scale, very small pockets here and there. Should it come back? If you are interested in true well-being of humanity on the planet, it must come back because from simplest things, everything that we have done in the world today, the style of or the mode in which we are doing today. For example, one biggest thing that everybody is talking about today is about your subject, economics. The economic engine of the planet is driven all by more and more and more. But physical world <coughs> is a world of limited quantities. More, more, more is only destructive. More, more was possible, was thought of by a certain group of people in the world when they believed they will enslave the entire world for their well-being. When that was the basis, more, more, more was possible. You could always make other people have less, less, less and you have more, more, more. There is no question of entire population on the planet having more, more, more. It's totally out of question because there is no more. So, these… these flaws, if they have to be fixed genuinely, before… you know, India is getting rapidly westernized, okay? Many parts of India, urban India is more west than west, all right? <laughs> it's more American than American, many people in the country. So before it becomes an all-encompassing thing, we must bring it up, not for the sake of preserving a nation's culture. I am personally not identified with any nation or any piece of geography or uh, history for that matter. 
But this is the only culture which is nurtured seeking. It is… if you look at fundamentally why India was recognized as one country, though at times politically it was nearly five hundred entities, at the same… in spite of that, people from outside recognize this as Bharat or Hindustan or as one nation and people within the country also felt their one nation, though they were revel, uh, ruled by various kings, is just this. Always this land has been a land of seekers, never a land of believers. Fundamentally, the difference between seeking and believing means, seeking means you have realized that you do not know. I do not know is the basis of seeking. Believing means what you do not know, you have chosen to assume and concretize your assumptions and put God's seal on it, finished. <laughs> Once you put divine seal on your stupidity, you can never come out of it, okay? <laughs> yes, once you get heavenly approval for all the stupid things that you do, there is no way out for you, you're stuck. Here this is a culture where even if God appeared or somebody appeared whom you believed is God, still they cannot give you commandments, this is the thing to do. Well, for example, the most famous book probably is uh, the Gita in India. Well, he is supposed to be God himself, whatever he says, the other guy is arguing and arguing endlessly, asking a thousand questions, because even he cannot give commandments to him. It has to make logical sense to him, otherwise he is not going to take it. This is not today's culture. Five thousand years ago, this is the way we have been. This is the way we are right now, but Today because we have been, you know, twenty… Uh, two hundred fifty years ago or three hundred years ago, we were the strongest economy on the planet, everybody wanted to come to India because it was the richest nation. Well, last ten, fifteen generations we have fallen on bad times. Because of that, nobody listens to what you're talking. Slowly it will change because in the world, if your voice has to be heard, first thing you must be successful. There is no substitute for success, unfortunately. It doesn't matter what brilliant things you're talking about, unless you're speaking from the platform of success, nobody is willing to listen to you. Um, but the, the idea of seeking is quite an interesting one, taking that in some sense it's, it's a very post-modern, in fact post-industrial idea <laughs> about how to think about the world, which is essentially that we put every assumption of of our lives uh, or ideologies and we try and dissect it. Now, there is one danger in this, in that it can lead to you becoming uh, uh, negative or even begin to think that sort of mysticism is some sort of a monasticism, i.e. meaning that is surely not what you're trying to say here. It's not, it's not a self-denying way of life that you are describing. Tell me, if you don't take out your twelve-cylinder car today and you chose to go on a bicycle, is it… is it self-denial or is it eco-sensitive? It depends who is looking at you, right? Somebody chose to sit in a place under a tree and he was happy sitting under a tree. Why do you call it self-denial? He might have found something that you not imagined possible. He has found something which you cannot even imagine. That's why sitting in a tree, he is fine. So many of these ideas that you are uh, telling us, I believe some of it came to you while you were… Uh, you were uh, since you mentioned bicycle, but maybe on a mobile, uh, crisscrossing India. So uh, it would be wonderful if you could give us some sense of what is it that you… that really you found as you crisscrossed this uh, country that uh, inspired you to begin thinking like this? Initially, I did most of South India on my bicycle. Oh, in the bicycle? Initially, <laughs> I did Southern India on my bicycle. I was… Uh, I was uh, planning a, um, an expedition on my bicycle to Moscow. Okay. Okay <laughs> But then my father a little lost his mind, thinking how I will go to… <laughs> <laughs> Moscow on my bicycle, two of my friends went. They came back after all nearly four years. 
being on the bus. They made it. <laughs> they went to Moscow, they went all over Russia, they went through all this, now all those, uh, you know, the twenty and odd Central Asian countries and they came back after four years. Well, I got uh, kind of <laughs> sabotaged <laughs> anyway. My travels, I was… Uh, I was just flipping through your geography history book, you know. This geography and history is a little… I had a joke for you, it's okay? Yeah, sure <laughs> uh, A novice uh, bank robber wanted to try it on a gas station first. So he walked into the gas station, pulled out his gun and he said… He put his gun to the salesperson and said, all the cash, otherwise your geography <laughs> He said, come on, you mean history, isn't it? <laughs> now he said, no, don't change the subject <laughs> So when I was reading your book, I thought of this, okay <laughs> It's a… it's a geography book, but it's history <laughs> You're not changing the subject, it's the same subject <laughs> Geography and history is the same subject, that's a point of your book in many ways <laughs> So, for me, all these travels, I traveled without any purpose. I was not going to any particular place, I simply rode across India. For me, because I… I never thought nor do I even today think in words, I only see pictures and videos in my mind always. Even today, what I did those many years ago, I remember every feature of land. It's very difficult to explain this. I'm not talking about some great mountain or river or a waterfall, not like that. Those definitely I remember. I'm talking about every corner, one little outcrop, one little bird was sitting on the tree, one small this, one anthill here, one there. It's just in my mind. This is the biggest pleasure for me when I want, I play back <laughs> Just simple terrain, the land just took my heart away, just looking at the land. Then came people for me, because in my mind, in my experience, er everything I look at it is all, first of all, is geometry for me. If I look at a human being, I… first thing is I look at the various aspects of geometry, and if I look at them right now, I will tell you in ten years what problem they will have. Because if their geometry is okay or not okay, is so visible. The very way they sit and stand, you can see what are they going to get or not get. Because geometrically, whether it's right or wrong, the entire physical existence is a consequence of geometry. Only what is geometrically right will last. What is not geometrically right will not last. How long something lasts simply depends upon whether it's geometrically correct or not. I think they were showing those buildings. It is all about geometry for me. And the very word yoga means this, that you align your physical geometry with the cosmic geometry, suddenly what is there is here also for you because you're properly aligned. So when I looked at the terrain, which at that time only India, now I traveled all over, but at that time when I traveled, it was all about geometry, how a little rock… St I'm not talking about huge, massive uh, monumental rock. I'm talking about a little stone was sitting as I was riding from the corner of my eye, saw that stone, that stone still lives in my mind. So this is how I just absorbed India into me. Then it came to people. I just ride into some village, walk into some home, any home. I just walk in and I say, I'm hungry. They would look at me, who is this guy? But they said, okay, and they would arrange a meal for me. I would eat there and if I wanted to sleep there, right there, either if they allowed me in the house or just outside the house, I slept there and early morning I was off again. So for me, I didn't… I never introduced myself, nor many times I never asked their names, nor did I exchange email ID because there wasn't one at that time <laughs> There was no need to again reach back and contact them, nor did they have any need to know who I am. It was just like that, this is India <laughs> Just come together as if 
you belong to them, tomorrow morning you're gone like you never existed. This is how I traveled, very, very rare, you know. In these entire travels, I remember maybe five or six times I stayed in a hotel room. Otherwise, I slept in anybody's home or sometimes just outside in the town. In the center of the town, I would sleep, people would come and ask, who, what, this, I'm traveling like this. Somebody would take me and give me food because I'm saving every rupee for more gas. More gas means more miles. <laughs> So my impression of India and people and the culture was, there are no lines. If you don't carry lines, there are no lines. A lot has changed since then, of course. So many things have happened, people are suspicious about each other, there has been terror attacks, there are bombs, everybody wants to frisk you from top to bottom now. <laughs> so many things, that's because of the events that have taken place, otherwise, this is India. Even today I'm sure it's true in rural India, it's still like that. You can walk in anywhere and it's okay. If they're what they have, they'll share it with you. It's not some great meal they're serving you. If you approach in a certain way, everything is wide open because there are no lines in people's minds. Lines are being… now being drawn because people are going to schools now, everybody's getting educated. Educated means you become less and less inclusive. See, this is the kind of education we're getting. The more educated you become, the less inclusive you become. There was a time, I've gone and stayed with families, a family of over four hundred people. Okay. In Karnataka, in the, in the coastal Karnataka, there are families where four hundred people in one family. And one more guest, they don't even care, okay? <laughs> you also stay and go, what's the big deal? But. Today, gradually it came down, family meant you, your wife, your children, your parents, not her parents ever <laughs> And slowly your parents went out, now just wife and kids. If you move west, you will see kids also out as soon as possible. And slowly husband and wife are living in many homes, I'm telling you, I'm not joking. There are people, husband and wife, married for many years, now separated but not legally separated, living in adjacent homes only when they want, otherwise separate homes because they can't stand each other. This is the form of education we are imparting on the entire world where inclusiveness is not possible. Slowly you can't stand anybody over a period of time because the way of thinking is becoming so logically correct. The more logically correct you are, you look at anybody, nobody seems to be okay. Really, you're logically hundred percent correct, you think. You look at them, nobody is okay. If nobody is okay, it is not a question of correctness, it is a question of madness. The first sign of psychological disturbance is you start thinking nobody is okay except you. <laughs> we are heading towards that big time. The, the statistics tell me that thirty-eight percent of the European population is psychologically ill every year. 350 million Europeans go through serious psychiatric treatment. This so, is… So what you're describing is, you know, continuous individualization into yes. silos. And this is not just about individuals and silos, but this is also a thought process, a wider thought process, which is true maybe… No, this is essentially happening because your idea of intelligence has become purely intellectual. Intellect is like a knife, it's like a scalpel. Yeah. Whatever you give it, it will slice it into two and look at it. Then it's not happy, it will slice it into four and look at it. Then it is not happy, it will slice it into eight and look at it. This is the way of the intellect. Mm -hmm. Intellect knows everything only by dissection, cutting everything into pieces. This is the way we have developed science. This is the way our logical thinking process is because we have come to this place that intelligence means intellect. The Indian way of life, we have looked at human mind as sixteen parts. To make it simple, I will make it into four here. This is called as buddhi, manas, ahankara and chitta. These are different dimensions. Intellect means only buddhi is being used, which is a sharp knife. This sharp knife is a good instrument for you to survive in the world. It dissects everything and shows you. But 
Right now you want to… you want to know somebody who is dear to you, you can't dissect them and know them. <laughs> you won't have them, that's all if you dissect them. This is what is happening, we are not understanding the distinction between intellect and the deeper dimensions of intelligence which functions within us. The intelligence within us is inclusive in nature. As you sit here, you may hate the person who is sitting next to you, if you… okay, I didn't mean you should, it's not an instruction <laughs> You may hate the person who is sitting next to you, but unknowingly you are inhaling what they are exhaling right now <laughs> and you have no problem. Yes? You no problem, body has no problem because the deeper intelligence within you has no issue. But if you just intellectually think, oh my God, I'm inhaling this person's breath sitting next to this person, you can't sit there anymore. Yes? You cannot sit there anymore. This is the nature of the intellect. It keeps on dividing, dividing, dividing. The other dimensions of intelligence have not, not made like this. Right now, we are able to live only because this is inclusive. What you exhale, the tree is inhaling, what the tree exhales, you're inhaling. This is how life is happening, not just this. Right now, what is happening in every subatomic particle in this body is reverberating across the cosmos in so many different ways. I'm not a talking philosophy, I'm talking about physics. Now, this is this sort of inclusive way of thinking. Um, I think in many… No, no, you cannot think inclusively. If you don't think, you're inclusive <laughs> Okay, that's a, that's, a fabulous, that's a fabulous way of thinking. I mean basically, <laughs> of feeling, I don't know, what would be the correct word for it? See, because… Uh, experience it, uh, perhaps… perhaps the people, <laughs> people ask me, Sadhguru, what are you usually… Today morning I'm doing an interview with some… FM radio in India because it's a Tamil New Year's Day is coming. Sadhguru, what is your thought process all… most of the time when you're not teaching or speaking? I said, I don't have any. I don't think. What is there to think? I don't know. I, I don't think, that's all. I, I just walk around joyfully with an empty head, that's why I don't have the burden of knowledge. There is… I've never felt burdened by it because I don't carry it first of all. I don't have a single thought in my mind, most of the time <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, th there is a certain art to it that must surely be… Uh, okay, we can't put it down into certain steps maybe uh, in, the, in, the, in the siloed way, but if you had to sort of describe the way one sort of… if one had to dissect say a global problem or something, how would say this particular approach deal with it as opposed to the way we now do with it, which is to break it down with sub-parts, solve each little bit and put it back together. See, the parts will never make the whole. Suppose I will get you a pair of kidneys, one nice, very healthy liver, heart, this, that, everything. Okay, make it into one's… Uh, another human being and give it to me, let me see. It'll not work like that. Parts will… parts will not make a whole. Parts are there, yes. Now, if you want health also, Right now, why I mention this, you know, the healthcare b industry becoming bigger than the food industry is simply because of this, because you have a kidney doctor, you have a lung doctor, you have an eye doctor, you have a knee doctor. It is not far where there will be a separate doctor for your right eye and left eye <laughs> because there is a difference between the two. Yes. There is a difference between the two. So tomorrow if you go on specializing, you will need hundred doctors to have a health checkup. By the time you get appointment from hundred doctors, definitely you'll be sick <laughs> So specialization is a good thing to a point, but now we can't stop it because see, we see one more thing and one more thing. If you divide the atom, there are too many things there, so you will need specialists for all that. By the time you get there, you will get lost because the sophistication of the physical creation is such, for every atom you will need one specialist and for every subatomic particle you need further specialists. So at that rate, what will you know, I'm asking, you will not know anything. There is another way to know everything, simply by embracing something, either by dissection you know or by embrace you know. You know life only by inclusion. 
Dissection is an exclusivity process, elimination process. But if you want to know these people, you know them only by inclusion, not by elimination, isn't it? So what is good for material things, you're trying to make it happen for every aspect of life. Life does not work like that. If you give this flower to a scientist, first thing he will do is he'll rip it apart. Yes, that is the way he will study it. Did you miss the point? Yes, he will know all parts of it, but he won't know the flower. But the beauty of the flower, everything that you know, need to know about life, in a way this flower is the peak of that plant's life, isn't it? Yes. Instead of absorbing that, instead of including that within you, because every life's aspiration is only to reach the peak of what li whatever this life is possible, isn't it? Yeah. Whether you are an earthworm or a grasshopper or a flowering plant or a mango tree or a human being, the only aspiration is to become a full-fledged piece of life, isn't it? By elimination will that happen? So now a global problem, if I don't break it down, how do I know? Only because you're breaking it down, problems are multiplying. Okay. You know, in India, they talk about uh, certain… Uh, <clears throat> certain forces like Mahishasura or somebody. The stories are, if you… if one drop of blood falls on the ground, one more guy will rise. Another drop falls, another guy will rise. That is what it is. Rakta Beej. Huh? Rakta Yes. <laughs> I'm saying the Rakta Beej is all we're doing, we're only complicating the world like never before. We're not solving problems, let's at least admit that. We're having sophisticated explanations for our problems. Problems are not gone, isn't it? So I'm going to change back a little bit here. And you know, m most of us here live, live in Singapore, we, we have… many of us have children who we are bringing up uh, in, in Singapore, outside of uh, India. And we want to take some of the, this line of thinking and pass it down to them. What are the, uh, the, you know, one or two things that you think are the critical parts of our, our culture and civilization that I think we, we should try and get them to imbibe? I see both your boys are in kurta at least <laughs> <laughs> See, we need to understand this. What we call as Indian culture is not a mode of dress, a mode of speech or a certain way of doing things. Fundamentally shifting life from belief to seeking. When I say b shifting life from belief to seeking, people feel their life is strong when they believe something. All these days they've been talking about believing in God. These days it's become a fashion to say, I believe in myself. You believe in things that you do not know. <laughs> you can't believe in something that's here, either you know it or you don't know it, isn't it? Yes or no? This is all the option is, either you know something or you don't know something. Because you're unwilling to admit you do not know, you say, I believe in it, because it gives you confidence, but confidence without clarity. Confidence without clarity is a disastrous process. If you have clarity, you will see everything the way it is. If you don't have clarity, at least you must have hesitation. But if you have confidence without clarity, you don't see a damn thing, but you're dead sure. <laughs> there are too many people like this, believe me. But the opposite of that is there, that if, if you see everything clear, would you not get paralyzed? <laughs> <laughs> if reality is going to paralyze you, then you have to live in hallucination. When I say belief, belief need not be of any sense, you just believe because it gives you confidence. For a long time people have believed in somebody up there managing your life, Upparwala if you're a North Indian <laughs> So, uh, first of all, we are sitting on a round planet and it's spinning. If you're looking up, you're invariably looking up in the wrong direction, you're on the equator in Singapore. 
you invariably looking up in the wrong direction. At least if you look towards Delhi, maybe you're looking northward a little bit <laughs> So I'm saying you are incapable of knowing what is up and what is down in this cosmos. Nowhere is it marked this side up. Have you seen this side up mark in the cosmos, in the galaxies somewhere? No. You don't know what is up, what is down. If you go further south, even people in Australia, down under, they think they're also looking up, isn't it? So there is no up-down business. This is why in what is called as Indian ethos, the fundamental things which are essentially different from every other culture on the planet is, one thing is there's no belief system, another thing is there's no God because always you have been told that your life is your karma. What this means is karma means action or doing. When we say your life is your karma, what's being said is your life is your making, entirely your making. There is nobody else influencing from anywhere. But so many things are happening beyond me, how? That is because, just tell me, today morning you woke up, from that moment to now, there are four types of action, physical, mental, emotional and energy actions are happening. Every moment of your wakefulness and sleep, it's happening. From the moment you woke up till now, how much of your activity or how much of your karma in body, mind, emotion and energy are you conscious of? Hmm? How much do you think? Percentage, tell me. How much percentage do you believe you have conducted consciously in body, in mind, in emotion and energy? Probably quite small. Way below one percent, okay? You might have done a few things consciously, rest is all simply happening. When so much is happening unconsciously, the results that happen out of that unconscious action, you try to attribute it to something. See, right now, if I take this object and throw it up and I forgot, after some time it'll come and land on my head. Now I think, who did this to me? <laughs> all right? <laughs> If somebody looks suspicious little bit, I'll pounce on him <laughs> because I don't remember throwing this up. <laughs> so when ninety-nine percentage plus, ninety-nine plus percentage is unconscious, obviously the results are not something that you can account for, yeah. but it is entirely your making. When we said it's entirely in your making, when we said your life is your karma, in one word, we destroy the heaven and everything else. All the people who worship… whom you worship in that country are people who walked the geography at one time. We looked up to them because of certain qualities. When I say certain qualities, for example, Ram, he's a big icon because you're talking about UP, central UP. <laughs> uh, in Ayodhya and uh, whatever, Misfortunes, his life is full of misfortunes. He is a rightful king because of some political situation, he goes to the forest to live in the jungle. With his newly married wife who, who is a princess, she is not made to live in the jungle. And his brother out of his love leaves his wife and his family and goes behind them to take care of them. Oh, they lived in the forest means you watch some stupid movie where uh, they were walking like this and golden colored uh, de deers were floating around and they had such a romantic life. No, I will tell you, you… you go and camp in the forest for three months. <laughs> Believe me, we can't recognize you, you will become like that in three months' time. Yes, you don't know what it means to live in a jungle, not today. Seven thousand… six or seven thousand years ago when it was fully on, jungle was fully on, not like today, it's not a reserve <laughs> Entire country is forest, full of wildlife, living there with a young woman who is not trained to live there is not a simple thing, it's a severe punishment for anybody. As if that was not enough, Ravana came and kidnapped her, Ravana was not a tiger, he was a lion <laughs> So, and then the man 
goes in search of his wife. You know, like uh, I was in a small town in Andhra Pradesh, and one little girl, one thirteen, fourteen-year-old girl stands up and asks, Sadhguru, they say that Rama went walking from all the way from Ayodhya to Sri Lanka to find his wife. Is it true? How is it possible? It is not practical, isn't it? And I looked at her and said, see, you're still a little girl, but in a few years you'll find a man. When you find a man, do you want a man that if you get lost, he will anyway come looking for you or he thinks it's not practical and find solution <laughs> Find solution in the neighborhood <laughs> Oh, she knows, she wants the man who will come in search. So the man is so… whether he is in love with her or he is committed to his wife, he goes looking down south and finds her after a huge battle, brings her back. She is fully pregnant, again some political situations, again he sends her to the forest. She bears children in the jungle, he doesn't know whether it's boys or girls, no sonogram <laughs> He doesn't know whether it's boy or girl or boys or girls, she delivers twins and he doesn't know. And then he wages a war, he gets into a battle with these boys, not knowing they're his children, he could have killed them. If you kill your own children, it's the worst tragedy that can happen in your life, isn't it? He was almost on the verge, he could have killed them. Fortunately, he did not kill them, but if he had killed, he wouldn't know he would have killed because he went out to kill them. With the intent of killing them, he went out, but somehow he did not succeed and then she died in the jungle, he never saw her face. Do you call this a successful life? I'm asking you. You must say something, otherwise I'm going to bless you <laughs> Do you call this a successful life? No. no. But we worship him. We worship him not because he was a super success of the day, we worship him because it doesn't matter what life threw at him, he remained the same, equanimous. No matter what anybody did to him, he maintained his dharma of being who he is, so we bow down to him. It doesn't matter because what life does to you is not always your choice. What you do is your choice, this is what karma means. So he was completely in charge of his karma, world did all kinds of things to him. But he remained the same, he never became bitter, he never became hateful, he never became angry. He continued to do what he was required to do without being pulled off track. So for that quality we worship him because when we said our Sanskriti, you must understand the word Sanskriti, some means equanimous, it also means exuberance. Kriti means to do life in an equanimous and exuberant way. Equanimous, not in a death-like way, exuberant, not in a drunken way, equanimous but exuberant. If you conduct this life like this, your… this is called as Bharatiya Sanskriti. So he is an epitome of that. All kinds of things were done to him, the worst kind of things. What… what worst things can you happen to you than other than what happened to Rama's life? Tell me, series of tragedies, isn't it? Disaster after disaster. but. He is in Sanskriti, he conducts his life with full involvement and equanimous. It doesn't matter what his personal tragedies are. So this is why we worship him, not because he was a super success. So our idea of success is this, if a man can go through this life untouched, no matter what happens, poverty comes, wealth comes, success comes, failure comes, he goes through it untouched maintaining who he is without losing his humanity, then we say he's a successful man, then we say he's a Mahapurush. So Rama is worshipped for that. Fabulous. This is a… this is a great point.